Hello everyone and a warm welcome to the Mobile IT Community of Interest, the March meeting of 2016. Thank you very much for joining us today. Just before we get started, I'd like to review how to use the GoToWebinar system to optimise your experience. Let me briefly explain how you can interact during this monthly meeting. Everyone on the call is currently set to default mute due to lots of participants. You can, however, get the audio over your telephone, which I hope you've worked out by now, or use the speakers on your computer to improve the sound quality. The panel is set to hide automatically. Uh, please use the orange arrow on the right-hand side. Uh, you can change this setting in the view menu at the top of the panel. You're encouraged to please forward any questions that come up using the questions tab. Your questions will be read after the main presentation and we can identify who's asking the question in order to foster greater participation and interaction between the attendees. If you would, however, like to remain anonymous, please let me know when you send the question. We also set to have some live polls at the end uh, with multi-choice answers. Um, you're able to answer from the screen by clicking on the choices provided. And finally, at the end of the meeting, we will have a follow-up survey. Please do respond to the questions. Um, it, it helps to incorporate feedback into the work of the community and, um, well, hopefully forward what we do within um, the sessions. Thank you. We will now start the presentation. So I'm Stuart Young and I represent Fiatech in Europe and the Middle East and, of course, Comet in the UK. On behalf of us all at Fiatech and Comet, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for the Mobile IT Community of Interest, the March meeting. Today's presenters are Peter Slater of Costain and Todd Sutton of Zachary, both of which will present on safety, operation, regulation and training for UAV technology in construction. Before we get to the presentation, I'd just like to take a minute to introduce our Mobile IT Community of Interest to those who are not familiar with either Fiatech or Comet and those who are new participants to the community. The objective of the community of interest is to truly showcase the mobility solutions and opportunities that will or have been adopted in the capital projects industry. We strive to achieve this goal by presenting the latest cases of mobile IT adoption and also by allowing the breadth of community participants to expose their perspective on these technology applications. We have been delivering use cases and industry perspectives through various channels, including monthly meetings such as this one, both virtually and live. Documentation and reports on these gatherings are also available uh, to help in the furthering of the community and also by facilitating the creation of research and development projects within both organisations. This community is a joint venture between Fiatech and Comet. A little bit about Fiatech. It's a member-based organization with an objective of improving the productivity of capital projects throughout the industry and the deployment of technology. Our goal is to improve productivity in the capital project sector through the adequate leadership in global development and adoption of innovation practice. Comet is a UK-based organization whose principal aim is to learn from experience to deliver measurable business benefits in terms of adoption of mobile technologies. This ongoing partnership supports the work and objectives of the community. So who's in the community? The community of interest is uh, over two years old now. Um, throughout the previous months, we've had more than 1,550 participants from over 460 organizations located in 43 countries. Mainly participants are located in North America and Europe. But as we continue to expand in the, in the Middle and Far East, we're beginning to attract participation from South America and elsewhere. We're very pleased with the industry response so far, and we're continuously working to meet the needs of our participants. I've got a couple of announcements to make. Um, in addition to the survey that will follow this session, we have an upcoming event next month in USA. This is the Fiatech Spring Conference from April through to the 6th. We have a general session to hear about proven case studies on mobile IT. This will be a mobile IT panel and provide the audience an overall view and perspective on the current state of mobile technologies, any available application of software, rationale for investment, 
where they can be applied across the asset life cycle and implications on current and future working practices. Various products will be highlighted associated with the case examples as well as they have been used on real projects. We will also, as discussed later in this presentation, have a presentation on the Eye in the Sky project. This presentation will give an overview of the past two years as how application of unmanned aerial vehicles equipped with cameras and laser scanners for mapping project sites has exponentially grown. The current practices remain limited to data collection, which are often not accurate and complete enough for performance analysis purposes without the systematic data collection and BIM-driven analytics. To address these issues, this new project plans to deliver adoptable and adaptable guidelines for the implementation, safe use, operation of UAVs for monitoring construction and the operation of capital projects. For further information on that, please do have a look at the website. Now, uh, let's move on to the main presentation. Um, Peter, I mentioned earlier, is, he's up first. Peter will explain to us the elements of, of the safety, operation, regulation and training for UAV, UAV technology and construction from a UK perspective. Peter's bio. Um, Peter, civil and structural engineer by trade, having completed a master's in finite element analysis at Newcastle University in the UK. Spent time working for Cobham PLC and InterServe before joining Costain in 2014. After, after working at Sizewell C, nuclear constructability, moved on to the London Power Tunnels project, working across three major North London sites. In April 2015, joined an informal team that was to present to the Board of Executives at Costain about the business opportunity of the choice. They chose the hugely influ influential technology of remote piloted airborne systems. The company agreed with the proposition so with the help of one or two other team members, Aerial Solutions was formed. Aerial Solutions has been researching and developing this technology at Costain through the engagement of third party suppliers and the integration into the current construction processes, including the creation of governance documents, best practice, safe operation and benefits capture. Peter, I will now pass it over to you. Right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I hope you can. I hope you can hear me well. Thank you very for mu much for that introduction, Stuart. I'll dive straight into this presentation as I'm conscious of time, and hopefully throughout the next sort of 20 minutes, I'll be able to give you a nice overview of the regulatory environment, some of the opportunities, and certainly the lessons that we've learned deploying UAV technology across some of the construction sites we're involved in. As I'm unaware of the level of understanding about re remote piloted airborne systems or UAVs, uh, the first slide is just a little introduction to the different models. And Stuart, I um, hate to say, but I have not got control of the PowerPoint. One second. No problem. There we go. Panic over. Alrighty, diving straight in at the high-end consumer models, we have sort of DJI Inspire at the one to two thousand pound mark. You have fixed wing surveying platforms in the mid-range, such as the SenseFly EB, typically around twenty-two thousand pounds. This is all in sterling. Apologies. Uh, at the high-end multi-rotor commercial end, you have systems such as the Falcon 8 Trinity that are around the thirty to thirty-five thousand pound mark. And certainly, uh, some of the development across Europe has seen models such as the Brammer RTK in the more £45,000 sterling mark for large area surveying. Obviously, when we talk about UAVs, we're talking about the whole system. So the platform, the computer control system there, the pilots operating it, that all comes under the general term. And a lot of these systems are driven by pre-planned flight routes based at a ground control station, often a laptop. So just in terms of, from Costain's point of view, why we've been embarking on this investigation and deployment, better insight, lower costs. So really reducing the number of man hours it requires to keep track of large areas of construction and understanding the progress reporting. It gives us the opportunity to have sort of 
parallel workflows, if you imagine. We're very good at using the 3D in a computer environment, but in the real life, are we really making the most of the airspace above these very, very congested construction sites? This allows us to free up some of that area on the ground and still um, get a lot of work done over the top. And of course, the implementation of visual thermal, ultraspectral, and gas monitoring as Moore's law reduces the size of these sensors so they're available uh, on these UAV platforms. Safety improvement is an absolute given in terms of removing surveyors and operatives from congested sites where there are large plant moving around constantly. And there is a little bit of people are chasing each other. So across the industry, people are starting to adopt UAV technology such as Crossrail, Bechtel, Barhale, Atkins, and that's feeding the process of everybody else's ears perking up as it were. Not only that, but also in the supplier side, major um, plant suppliers like Walters, Caterpillar, Komatsu are all starting to uh, build relationships with UAV providers and software operators. So, as I'm sure is the same in many parts of the world, this gives you an indication of the certified operators in the UK since the certification system was brought out in 2010. So, for the first two years, there were really only about 200, 250. In the last 20 days, there have been another 82. So, it's a massive explosion of this capability across the UK. And each certified certificate that's given out can have up to 50, 60 pilots underneath it, so it gives you an idea. I guess it's about driving change as well, illustrating that there's another way to conduct very simple operations that before we would shut a whole road for or, or send two guys on top of a bridge for. Just a couple of examples here across the industry that's really driving it, renewables. So uh, wind farms, all those, those two look like they're having a good time, I do, really it's not particularly cost effective, not particularly safe. A lot of that is now being done by multi-rotors with uh, high definition cameras. A few years ago, no one was talking about this market and suddenly you get quotes saying, the inspection of one type of renewable technology is now worth six billion pounds. So, six billion dollars, excuse me. So you can see how it is feeding itself. Oil and gas, something we've seen in the North Sea in the UK has been a massive area as well. Traditionally, to inspect uh, flare stacks, etc., under deck, you need to have a very highly trained guy who's charging you a lot of money. More and more of that work is now being done by multi-rotors and trained UAV service operators. And what you start seeing is, without having to shut down parts of the plant, you're saving millions of pounds a day. And you see this in newspapers time and time again, and on these companies' websites, 80% saving, 4 million pounds saving. And this one, you know, they reckon they saved $11 million by not having to shut down because they can deploy this UAV in hazardous environments. Something that we've encountered as well is consistently and continuously paying ordnance survey for topographical information, so large areas of land that we do not know the exact contours of. Now, in a sort of power to the people moment, we're getting the ability to be able to fly over this area, use photogrammetry or LIDAR to capture the lay of the land, build our own models and do our own flood analysis and mapping. And this is something we're seeing across a number of um, major contractors. So just a quick summary of the multi-rotor market. So these are the multi-rotors. That gives you an idea there of the diversity of what these are being used for. Take note particularly of the solar panel inspections, infrared inspections, using those thermal cameras. And just a quick summary of the fixed ring and multi-rotor combined service market. So these are more large area surveying using that point cloud to get your volumetrics and your 3D analysis. Particularly mining has been a real hotbed for that where they're totally automating the process. Companies such as Rio Tinto are really good ones to look at. Uh, so just quick, quick lowdown of the legislation, the authority hierarchy that we're under in the UK. So ICAO is at the top. We've got the European Aviation Space Agency under them and who we deal with on a regular basis because all of our UAVs are under 150 kilos is the Civil Aviation Authority, particularly documents CAP 393, which is the law, and CAP 722, which is guide so if you break excuse me, if you break CAP 722 when you're working, you're likely to potentially lose your job. If you break CAP 393, you could well be looking at some time in the courts and potentially jail. So I'm going to summarize this because even though it's only two articles, it 
it can be quite long to go through article one so you can't allow any animal or article to be dropped from the UAV so this sort of covers deliveries number two is the most important one the person in charge of the small unmanned air aircraft may only fly the aircraft if reasonably satisfied that the flight can be safely made so this brings all the responsibility down to the pilot you can't just say my boss said do this so I did it because I'm unexperienced and I was nervous doesn't doesn't go that way it's all down to the pilot who is a trained and certified RPAS pilot so it needs to be within visual line of sight and unaided visual line of sight so you can't use binoculars first person videos etc section four is general operations most of that's in relation to over seven kilo drones that we don't particularly get involved in and if you're doing it for any work purpose or where anyone involved is going to have some sort of financial gain, you need to have a permission for aerial work from the CAA in addition to your remote pilot qualification. Article 167 is in relation to any UAV with data capture ability. So this could just be a noise sensor or it could be a camera or a laser scanner. Um, and this is where it gets really, really difficult for the UK operators because any congested area you can't go within. 150 meters of it UK is highly congested across its entire scope and subsequently it has been said that any UAV under seven kilo can operate within a congested area but you still have to remain 50 meters away of any person vehicle or building not under your control and that is a uh, quite a difficult area but a very very long conversation that we're not able to have at the moment under control means if the person vehicle or building has been forewarned of what you're doing and is aware of what you're doing and able to react the rules are then virtually removed and you can kind of do whatever you want as long as you follow 166 part 2 that says you are satisfied it's reasonably safe to do so yeah I've covered that point right I'm going to whiz through the what we've done and uh, what our learnings have been from that so we've been looking at routine progress in sight to the site's earthworks management and how to better inform cap capital replacement strategies. So why routine progress in site? Well, I don't know if you've ever worked on a construction site, but it's highly stressful. And when your construction site is 40 kilometers long and you have no idea what's going on along it, um, you can be up pretty late worrying about it and everyone gets a little bit stressed and the phones start ringing. So here is an example of a construction site well, I can guarantee you on this construction site there will currently be lots of people taking pictures with smartphones, with cameras, updating site diaries, logs. It's very piggledy-piggledy, skitter-scatter all over the place. So who's been looking into UAVs to combat this? Lang, O'Rourke, Amy, Atkins. General principle is have your young graduate or whatever trained to operate a UAV, get the qualifications, it costs a max about 2000 pounds overall buy a reasonably low price consumer drone at the end of every day or at the end of every half day he sends up the drone vertically above him picture 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 all the way around goes to the next place and what he does is he captures the critical work activities using the 4k high definition camera on board now rather than ending up with 400 photos or whatever at the end of every half day these are then stitched into panoramics, they're stitched into 360 spherical images so that they are consolidated and can be investigated by the site team remotely or by the client. These can then be tagged onto your site drawings or onto a KMZ on Google Earth and everyone's a lot happier basically. It's consolidating what we already do using the UAV as an enabler. Right. Um, that's all well and good if you've got a reasonably square or smallish site when you're looking at the site like this six kilometers long the multi rotors don't really have the ability to cover that sort of area viably so what you saw in that previous slide was a high level view of a fixed wing flight that we have done and actually recently redone over one of our road projects and the next this slide gives you an idea of the level of detail that you can get down to so we just highlight an area in the left picture expand it out so this is a small operation going on here we want to have a closer look 
and we can see that we're looking over where a wall's being placed. You can even see the operatives there and there, and if this, your screen's high resolution, you can see they've got their hard hats on, for example. As it's an author mosaic, you can draw your dimensions straight off that picture and your local site lat and longitudes. And this is all in the 2D at the moment, so the next stage will look at the 3D. So by deploying fixed wing UAVs on our highway sites, we've been able to gather author mosaic imagery, which is dimensionally accurate pictures, topographical 3D information, and something that we hadn't really thought about before, but what you then have is a record every single day of the plant, you, the materials, anything that you're paying for on site. So if you have contractual issues later when the project is finished and your suppliers say we had three cranes on, four dumper trucks and six dozers, you can go back and check whether they're actually telling you the truth or if they're trying to wrangle you. When you've got the UAVs on site, you can then start ticking off other activities. Here's an example of one of our, where one of our clients has asked for some imagery to illustrate where the current infrastructure is causing traffic, and then they use these images to justify this expenditure that they then put into the scheme to expand that roadway. Traditionally, we were doing this by putting a DSLR camera up on a crane, trying to take pictures, absolute nightmare, send the drone up there, He's on site anyway doing all your other technical activities and this covers off a client request and you can gather your nice panoramic imagery and your PR stuff. So you're starting to satisfy a number of people's requirements using this one platform. If we take the 2D into the 3D, this is an example of one of our sites where we've done a photogrammetry flight over where it takes lots of overlapping photographs, stitches these together into a 3D point cloud. Now you can start really delving into the data, pulling out volumetric analysis. You can do a survey one month, a survey the next month, and detect the changes that's happened between the point clouds using Cloud Compare software. It's not as simple as I'm making it out to be, but it's absolutely technically possible and something that we're see is very, very valuable. That's a cross-section there through one of the point clouds just to illustrate the continuity of the points and the, the quality of the survey data you get out. This video may or may not work. It's an illustration of a collaboration between Komatsu, which is a Japanese plant provider, and Skycatch, which is a major UAV service and software provider. Um, what it's illustrating here is the ability to fly over your site before you start construction, do your photogrammetry scan, which then gives you your 3D model. Everyone gets very excited, as you can see. You then take your 3D completion drawings of what you want, overlay those over the scan of your site of what you currently have, cut out what's left over. That gives you an idea of your volume of material you need to be moving. Everyone gets excited again. You can then start to have some real front-end planning of what sort of plant you're going to be needing to move that exact amount of volume and exactly where you want to put it. Again, I understand that's a marketing video. It's not quite as simple as that, but this is where – so this is one uh, that is currently being used in the UK as well. We haven't used it ourselves but I think it's extremely valuable, and this has come out of the oil and gas project. So what this is is a visualization of a transmission. Uh, it's, it's about, uh, I believe it's, it's nearly over a 1,000 transmission pylons are in that red line, and if you're the person who's in charge of making sure that those transmission pylons are, sorry, tra transmission pylons potentially might be an English word, but power pylons out in the countryside, uh, and if you're responsible for determining the state of these pylons and whether they need maintenance, it can be a real headache. And what this company, Cyborg, have done is really consolidated down the process of surveying these pylons and making the information easy to get to, to the, for the client. I'll show you that now. So here we're looking at the Google Earth view where the red line is tracing out the path of the transmission pylons, which I believe is providing power to Dundee there just in the right. We navigate down and the second layer of the portal, so this is all an online portal, cloud hosted, shows you an icon for each individual pylon. So there we're looking at number 65 and now we just want to click into that one to have a closer look at 65 and there we can see a nice uh, 
overview shot of 65, but importantly, what you have on the left-hand side is each element of that pylon that has been requested by the client to be surveyed. And along the bottom, you have all of your pictures in relation to each element. And when you click on those, there you've got your close-up shot of the exact part of the asset that they're interested in viewing whether there's obvious rust, whether there's obvious damage for whatever reason. And importantly, they provide a matrix. So you, the supplier Cyberhawk takes all of these images back to the office and visually analyzes them based on a matrix and gives them a score. So a score here from one to five. One being very, very poor and needs immediate attention. Five being absolutely fine, needs no attention. And what you can see along the bottom there is the entire pylon rated and it's given a number and a color. And the colors are important because when you start to take a step back and you start to look at the real trend analysis, then you see the value of being able to rapidly gather and potentially automatedly gather all of this information. So what you might identify is a real bad patch. This could be due to local geographical effects, environmental effects, animal intrusion, it could be a bad batch. What you start to do is really focus in on the areas that need action, action them immediately, and then take a step back and say, why was that area so bad? What have we done? Should we be building them elsewhere? Should we be building them in a different way? And then when you go back for funding next year from the government or whoever, you can start showing that you're making intelligent decisions. And this is only enabled by the speed with which you can gather all this data. And that's a quick summary of some of the areas that we've looked at, some of the areas we've actually deployed across our sites, and um, certainly an area that we think is really, really valuable for the infrastructure market at large, um, among many, many others. So we've looked at the exponential increase in the operators in the UK alone, how it can help you keep track of a large complex construction site where there's a lot of client interest and they want to be having a look at the pictures, not just you. Earthworks management, capital replacement strategies. Uh, I've got 20 seconds left. What do I think are the most important things moving forward? Immediate safety of the UAV. So this is a product called Flyability, recently won a Dubai prize for about a million pounds and is now being used to inspect the inside of gas tanks. So you can see the uh, sphere um, mesh around the UAV protects it so it can bump and bounce around. Uh, light air traffic control or drone air traffic control, so Nokia here are trying to really muscle in into this market to keep control of all the different users that are using UAVs and then some sort of central command where your company's 10, 20, 40 UAVs are kept track of, controlled. That's a little bit in the future, but that's where I see it going. Um, that's me, Stuart. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Hopefully, it's been interesting. Um, and I welcome any questions or any thoughts or comments. Okay, thanks, Peter. Thank you very much for that. That was very interesting. Um, I'll now move on to the next part of the presentation. Uh, we've got Todd, who, who again will take us through the safety operation regulation and training from a US perspective. Um, Todd has over 26 years of uh, construction industry services with various assignments related to project management. He has assisted with various business units to find process-based solutions through the implementation of technologies or construction methods to assist in project execution. Todd is very much part of the FIATEC um, family. He works on several projects studying real-time field reporting on construction job sites using smart devices. He's also involved in the Eye of the Sky project, which is a UAV project through FIATEC, and this is to establish guidelines and best practice for the implementation and safe operation of UAVs. Uh, equipped with digital and thermal cameras and laser scanners for monitoring construction and operation of projects. He is currently a co-roadmap champion for FIATEC's technology roadmap, roadmap element 4, intelligent and automated construction job site and co-roadmap champion for element 7 new materials and methods. Todd is also part of the productivity advancement target team for construction and advanced work packaging as well as mobile IT. Todd, thank you. I will pass it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. You should have control of the screen there. No, do not. Hold on. <laughs> 
Okay, let me try it again, excuse me. There we go. Okay, so today I'm going to go over the overview for specifically over the small unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, and Peter did a great job on explaining the different components of the system, so I'm going to try not to repeat anything he had covered. But what I want to cover uh, as part of our safety, operation, regulation, and training is how we're integrating those into our current safety practices and um, that we have on our projects. Um, so the first part I want to bring up is safety is our PPE. So this is a recommended PPE. Uh, now this consideration, this is for on the construction job site. So a lot of this PPE we require anyway on the projects. Um, and a lot of people when they see this for the first time, they're like, they're saying, well, why do you need work gloves for the, the small UAV? Well, it's not really when you're operating the the small UAV, it's when you're actually uh, doing any maintenance or setting it up uh, because there is, uh, especially on motor, uh, the uh, multi-rotor uh, devices, uh, there's rotors involved. So not that they would actually hurt, but they could cause bruising. So just as a safety precaution, you have the gloves. Um, yeah, actually using controllers, obviously you wouldn't need the gloves for that. Um, but I just wanted to touch base on those requirements. So uh, as you see, we got hard hats, safety glasses, safety vests, uh, actually reflective safety vests, uh, and then a long sleeve shirt, work gloves, long pants, and work boots. So this is just a, a sample. Um, this is just a generic industry uh, sample that I, that uh, based on a, our, our own process that we use internally. But this is a job safety analysis. Uh, a lot of people also call them a job ha hazard analysis. But basically just identifying all the, the what the activity is, what the task is, um, and then all the steps involved. And then you're, once you have that, the sequence of, of the, the steps involved, you look at any potential hazards, what they are, and then what, how can you correct those uh, and or either reduce or eliminate those hazards. Um, and so we do the, the, this will be done on every operation of the small UAVs. So this is an example of how we can, and so we would, we would develop tasks specifically for a small UAV. I just wanted to show this as an example for this particular session. So the next one is the FAA, uh, our federal um, aviation, aviation um, administration, they developed an uh, application for uh, smartphones, and it's called Before You Fly. Um, and I just want to show this because even though this is uh, also used for uh, recreational users, I think it's a great tool that we can use for commercial users to just check out the area you're in and just make just verify there's no there's no uh, um, ports or anything in your area. So this is actually from my current location. Um, if I if I go to it, it tells me there's a warning in this area. When I when I go to that, it tells me the identifies the warning warning uh, in this particular area is there's airports within five miles. Um, in the airports, it could be airfields or heliports. So when I click down on the uh, down into there then I can see in my current area where I'm at, um, we have uh, uh, hel uh, several heliports actually in this case, uh, and I can identify which one. So if I go to Camp Bullets, which is actually an Army base uh, close by m where my office is, I can go to that and see that it's actually a heliport, and it gives me the latitude longitude. I can also go to the map, and it gives me, the, so the blue circle is where I'm at, and you can see where all the overlapping uh, air controlled spaces are. So um, if I was to fly in this area, I would have to contact each one of the um, air traffic control uh, towers and notify them of my flight. So this is an example of how we're integrating the planning process. So. Typically on a construction site when you're doing um, uh, operation like a, a, you have a, a 
lift with a crane, for example, you have the lift, you develop a lift plan showing the area you're going to be working in, what you're lifting, what other perimeters are. So we're applying the same same operation to operating. So I created a tool set within Bluebeam, the Bluebeam review, and we use this tool set that I created to uh, for a small uh, UAS operation planning tool set. Um, so it gives me some tools I can work with to develop the flat path to get the, the, the mission area itself um, and way, any waypoints and, and also placing the copter viewpoint to where I want photographs to be taken. Uh, this isn't for controlling it, but we transpose this information to our ground control system um, after after we, we review it and, and plan it out. So this is just a planning tool, it's static, it's not has no relation to the operation of the devices. And then this is just a blow up of that. It gives you your mission area, square footage, and, and some additional details. Uh, this is what we use in conjunction with the, our uh, job safety analysis. Uh, and, and we have that. We take, you know, take out the field and uh, share that with the uh, everyone. Basically, we notify everybody on the job site what we're doing and and um, and what and what the purpose of the particular operation is so this is where we get into our small unmanned aircraft system itself and how uh, so we have a series of pre-operation checklists and also post-operation checklists um, that that we would use, um, and also equipment checklists as well to verify maintenance and at pre and post flight. And so the some of the the main components of the unmanned aircraft system is the of course the unmanned uh, aerial vehicle itself, a control station, the communication link, and the payload. And as Peter pointed out, there are several different types of payload. The most common is a camera, but thermal imaging, LIDAR devices. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different payloads that you could have on these devices, um, especially on your um, – so, again, what I'm talking about here on this trigger case is the, the, on the small uh, aerial systems um, is uh, basically uh, UAVs that are 55 – pounds and below. The UAS also has four elements to it, which includes the crew, the environment, the operation, and supporting, organi supporting organization. So we'll talk about the crew. So in the, with the crew consists, and this is a recommendation that I, from based on, on what we've been seeing on the job sites is uh, having the small UAS operator whose primary is going to be operating, keeping visual on the site of the, of the, the unit. Um, and, um, and that's his only job is to do the operation. He has final say uh, if the operation is going to take place based on the conditions, the environment, uh, weather, and um, in all aspects of the operation. He, is the leader of the of the team. Um, the visual observer primary focus is to also keep visual line of sight, but also is using the FPV system to record video and um, and take the photographs. Um, so the pilot has no the operator the operator themselves have no um, responsibility with that uh, part of the operation. That way they can concentrate on actually controlling the device. Um, and then the central on the construction site, basically to the complexity and activity on the site, you know, the third person to the team would be the situational awareness observer. And this person would be observing around the, uh, the other two team members um, and looking at all the environmental factors and equipment or people working around. Um, just to keep keep everybody aware of what's happening. So now we go into the regulation. 
on the regulation, we're looking at uh, currently we have the this this is a, a just a subset of data showing the FAA Section 333 exemptions granted to date. So back in October 2015, there was approximately uh, there was 1,429 exemptions granted. Uh, as of March the 28th, uh, the current data that's available is March 28th, 2016. There's 4,254, and that that's uh, over 2,828 uh, new exemptions granted since October. Uh, with that said, there's uh, over the, just the last seven days, there's been 144 exemptions granted. So uh, that's that seems to be the pace that, that, that that's going. Uh, these exemptions, uh, there's still, still some confusions about what the exemptions, but on the exemptions, it's allowing to, to it's still, the one of the major requirements is that you still have to have a pilot in command operating the small UAVs. Uh, uh, and so this um, is, you know, still a, so I think it's still holding back from you know being widely adopted across all the job sites and all the uh, especially in the construction industry in particular. So I think uh, that's that's one of the factors that's really uh, inhibiting the widespread use uh, here in the U.S. Anyway, uh, now the good news is uh, just yesterday uh, on March 29th that the FAA uh, had a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive risk analysis, and they raised the unmanned aircraft UAS blanket altitude authorization for Section 333 exemption holders and government aircraft operators to 400 feet. Um, previously, um, it was restricted to 200 feet, which was another misconception. A lot of people thought they could fly up to 400 feet, even with the exemptions. And in most cases, that wasn't that wasn't a uh, that wasn't a valid assumption. Um, so, but now it is. So, I just wanted to. That's a just news that just came out yesterday. So, what I'm going to talk about next is the FAA small. Whoops. whoops one, two, three. So, the FAA small UAS. Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, Part 107. This actually came out last year and, uh, and it went through uh, uh, review. Um, everybody was able to give comments. Comments closed of April 25th uh, of 2015. Um, there still has been no final rule made on it, uh, but it's still a it's still in in you know part in the work of progress. But it, I just want to touch base real quick. Because um, the four main areas where it covered, where this actually addresses is the operational limitations, um, and then the operator certificate certification responsibilities, aircraft requirements, and model aircraft. Um, the biggest change overall, um, and I'm not going to go into all the regulations. There's 195 uh, PDF uh, page PDF. You can read the full regulation um, if you go to FAA.gov and just search. Um, for uh, small UAS NPRM, um, or if you just search for small UAS, you'll find the links to it there as well. Um, but the biggest, the biggest news is the previous pilot requirements um, goes away, and the pilots would be considered as operators underneath this proposed rule, and the operators would be required to pass an initial aeronautical knowledge test at an FAA-approved knowledge testing center, and then be vetted by the, the Transportation Security Administration, TSA. And then they would uh, uh, be able to obtain an unmanned aircraft operator certificate with small UAS rating. So this, this would be a lot more uh, similar to what Peter described as far as the operator uh, certifications um, that are currently available in the UK. Um, except this one would definitely be by individuals and not by uh, a company um, for this uh, for the for the uh, operators themselves.
So next one I want to talk about is training. And so when you're going to get insurance for uh, on the for the small UAS systems, a lot of the insurance companies that, that specialize in these particular devices, there's not a whole lot of them um, here in the U.S., but the ones that do, um, they usually will require you to go, in this case, the unmanned, we were required to go to the Unmanned Safety Institute. Um, the Unmanned Safety Institute is, is currently, uh, I think it's in the process of being acquired by Argus International um, that and Argus provides specialized aviation services uh, around the world internationally. Um, and then the Unmanned Safety Institute uh, provides safety education and training services um, for uh, uh, the unmanned aircraft uh, systems professional operators. So real quick, uh, you know, the, the certification um, that I was required to take myself was the UAS safety awareness training. And mainly what that consists of is understanding the risks for your UAS operation poses to others in the air and on the ground. Identify mitigating hazards associated with your operations. And understanding rules and regulations governing airspace. And then the other part is to learn the attributes of a professional UAS operator. And then know the steps to decision making process and learn how to exercise good aeronautical decision making. So in addition to that training, we're looking at developing once regulations uh, get the final rule on the part 107, we're able to, to get certification. Um, additional training we would want our uh, our operators to have would be in addition to the previous uh, training, which is an e-learning course, um, which is five hours, we would have additional five-hour course as well. Um, and then we would have uh, 20 hours of simulator. This is a computer simulator simulating use of uh, the devices uh, using the same controller that they would be using out on the uh, with their with the device they're being assigned to. So whatever UAV they're assigned to, they will use a simulator to um, spend time learning how to do it. And this develops hand-eye coordination for that as well, um, and prepares them for when they actually get start the hands-on operating. Um, and then we have 20 hours of classroom instruction that'll help prep them for their actual training uh, or their aeronautical testing, and then 50 hours of hands-on operating instruction, um, which would be consistent through each level. So they'll start off at the hands-on um, with a operator, um, and then they will also start as part of the team as a situation awareness server into the visual server, and then, to, and then become the actual operator, and then once they complete their full hour. So this would be 100 hours total of training that we would require. Thanks, Stuart. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Todd. Super for that. Thank you. Um, the next part of the uh, presentation, I've got, I'm gonna, I've got some poll questions here for everybody. Uh, let me just bring them up. Okay, so I've got a question here. In terms of the UAV technology, do you trust the technology in construction is the question. Yes, trustworthy, maybe, but I have my doubts, or no. What does everybody think? Wow. That's amazing. We're currently about 83% yes, trustworthy. Couple more seconds, and I'll close that one out. Okay, I'll close that. 
and I'll share it. So, Peter, Todd, what do you think of that? 76% yes, trustworthy, 21% maybe, 3% no. Uh, Todd, shall I go first quickly? Yes. I, I think that's absolutely fascinating. I, I worry that I might be a bit of a pessimist now. I did think that it would be, um, you know, I have my doubts. Uh, that's really, really encouraging to see that there is a wide appreciation for the level of uh, safety inherent in the systems and also the quality of the data that you're getting out of them. I think a lot of people overlook the fact that this technology has been tried, proven a thousand times over in, in the military setting before it's really um, come into the commercial market. Um, but that's really, really excellent to, to, to see those figures. Uh, what about you, Todd? I, I feel the same way. I mean, I was, I, I was a, a, I'm an optimist on it, so I definitely, uh, definitely, I just can't wait till we can use it more widespread in construction. Though. Fabulous. I'll go on to the next um, question. What is the most important parameter for you to personally accept and drive UAV technology? Let me launch that. Is it cost? Is it proof of safety? Is it examples of it being used or changed regulatory environment? Okay, a couple more seconds, and I'll close that one up. Okay, thank you, everybody. So I'll share that one. Yep. Peter, Todd, what do you think? Todd, so, do you go first this time? Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's is the change of the regulatory environment. That's exactly you know what I feel. That, lines with what I say. Uh, for those on the cost side, uh, you know, the way I look at it and the way we've actually looked at it uh, is take a look at what you're currently costing you for uh, maybe do like monthly uh, aerial photos or, or videos uh, or even uh, quantity surveys uh, through aerial. Uh, now, instead of doing once a month, and, and uh, usually those services usually cost anywhere between, you know, say six hundred to a thousand dollars a month. Uh, depends on the area you're trying to, to capture. It could cost even more per month. Uh, depends on the, you know, how how much you're trying to capture. Um, and then, so just with those cost savings alone, you can actually uh, not only save money, but you can actually increase your bottom line uh, by implementing this technology. Yeah. Peter? Yeah, again, uh, r really interesting to see. I mean, perversely, the proof of safety, the examples of it being used, are what we need to take to the regulators to then allow the regulation to be changed legitimately, which will then release the majority of what is dry, we're just holding people and companies back from being able to invest in it heavily. So it really is a self self-feeding cycle but we can't essentially prove the safety and the examples of it being used extensively because the regulatory environment is tight so it's at the moment it's a catch catch 22 so it really is when i talk about the future of the uav industry being built upon the initial trials the work that's todd doing the, the work that stuart's doing that fear tech are doing that we're doing at costain that's why it's so important to keep pushing forward with these because they then change the regulatory environment which then frees up the entire um industry yeah okay thanks gents i'll move on to the next question um in your opinion it is a known entity set to solidify in the future of construction or is it a niche and unstable technology? So is it stable, is it unstable?
Okay, I'm going to close that one up. And share, we've got 88% say it's stable, 13% unstable. What are your thoughts on that? Peter, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go first. Uh, just before that, I, I have to say, looking back at that question that I did write, it's not a very good question, so I do apologize. It's probably not the most insightful of questions I've ever asked. Um, but again, I guess the result is still positive. Um, I think it is a the only instability I see in the technology is the immediate result of persons, companies, corporations misusing the technology that then has a massive media impact which destabilizes uh, the public trust but really it is a technological behemoth that is, is, is set to, to really change the way we do things. Uh, Todd? Yeah, I agree, Peter. Um, especially, especially with the, uh, that, that's the importance of having the training processes, procedures in place as well and integrated into your, your, your standard operating system, uh, procedures um, and safety program on your project so you are using the technology responsibly. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Peter. Um, I've got one more question. Which of the following are recommended? Are the recommended PPA, PPE items for all small USA UAS operations? Everybody see that now? That's launched. So we've got gloves, work boots, safety glasses, reflective vest, and hard hat. Actually, that's supposed to be all. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. I'll share that. So and actually, that was, that should have been all. It should have been. It should have been multiple choice. Yeah. So, or or a or another option, but that's oh, they're all correct. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thank you. Well, so so that concludes the um, um, that concludes the um, poll questions. So thanks very much, everybody, for participating in that, and thanks to Peter and and Todd for coming up with those questions and the choice answers. Um, I've now got um, the question and answers session, and let me just bring the let me just bring the questions up on the um, on the screen. Just bear with me a second. Okay, to answer the question about the slides, the slides will be available afterwards, but it will be available through the uh, YouTube facility. Um, the question I've got here is, does Zachary have a, an FAA 333 exemption? Todd? No, currently we do not because we don't have the pilots and we're not, we're not, uh, it, yeah, so we currently do not. Okay. What is what is the demand in the job market for Zachary? Is the market looking for more teams and operators? You mean for the UAS it, it, operation? It doesn't separate. It doesn't we we would our intention we would train existing personnel. Okay. What are your thoughts on semi-autonomous flights based on pre-programmed flight paths? Peter, do you want to answer that one? Yes, certainly happy to answer that. Um, very, very positive for them. You know, there is no doubt that no matter how hard a person can concentrate or how good they are as a pilot, if you look at the long term, the computer fully autonomous or semi-autonomous control systems provide a safer environment to operate in. Whenever we're doing fixed wing flight, 
it's all semi it's well, actually it's all fully autonomous so the flight plan is in beforehand the UAV simply follows this flight route it has a number of safety redundancy options so if it loses track of its data link or if it detects any issues in the wind speed or whatever it can simply um, circle for a while fly back home you know I think when you're operating a multi-rotor system very very close to a building that's when you want to take full manual control with a really experienced pilot because tiny little losses of GPS or gaps in your network or a little bit of wind can throw you into the building but when you're talking about large area surveying much safer to have a fully autonomous or semi-autonomous system the real real complex multi-rotor environments you want to have a trained pilot that's my view anyway Todd I actually don't have anything to add that's uh, I, I have the same opinion on that. Okay, thanks guys. Um, I've got one more. It's more of a statement than anything else from Robert Day. Um, proven business cases are most important, are the most important parameter to advance in UAS. Any comment, observation on that one? Todd? Uh, Peter? Oh, sorry, Todd, go on. Peter, Todd, uh, go on, jump in anybody. <laughs> Repeat that one more time. Proven business cases are the most important parameter to advance in UAS. That, that's um, a comment, a statement made, made by Robert Day. Do we agree? Yes, absolutely. I'll jump in. Sorry, Todd. I'll jump in. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. The difficulty at the moment with developing uh, proven business cases is a lot of the time that we operate, it's the first time we've done it. So the chances of getting a guaranteed commercial return on your first trial is slim, which then disincentivizes the person who's funding it. Now, what we've been able to do is prove a business case in one element of the flight each time. So for example, on one, we saved 160 kilos worth of CO2 emissions. On another, we saved five days worth of um, boots on ground time. So whilst the entire finished to, to stop of the project of collection of the data and the analysis was the same, it was an 80% reduction in the time we actually had to be on site. And in another one, we saved the cost. So we've got a bit of a patchwork of business cases for each element, and it's being able to bring them all together and prove an entire month's worth of operation has provided a financial benefit. And as soon as you do that, the door opens. So yeah, Rob's actually right. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to just make mention of uh, the Eye in the Sky project. I touched on it earlier. Um, the Eye in the Sky project is a fear tech project of, of which Todd is involved. And participation, um, I welcome participation. If anybody wants to get involved in that, please do. Um, I've got Manny is on the line. I'm just wondering if I can invite Manny to speak. Manny, can you hear me? Are you there? Manny, can you can you hear me? No, obviously Manny can't hear me. Um, but yeah, the the Eye in the Sky project um, it, it, it's it's been running a little while now, and what we're looking to do is we're looking to capture best practice. Now it's a six month project initially, um, but we're looking at best practice, and we're looking at getting as many organisations involved in what we're doing as possible. There's lots of people going off and doing their own thing, and and basically doing what others have done and, and learning um, where basically we could have shared information. So looking at collaboration, which is what Fiatech does, please email me, message me. Um, you want to get involved, I'm quite happy to, to have a discussion with you, online, offline, whatever. Um, the Eye in the Sky project, watch out for it. We, we did mention that we will present at the uh, conference next week. Um, and yeah. You're most welcome. Please, uh, please drop me a line. Contact any any of the presenters today, uh, myself, Anit. Um, look forward to hearing from you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to close up now. We're just past the uh, just past the hour, and the um, usual way to do this, if I can just click on the next slide, is continue the conversation. We've got LinkedIn, we've got Twitter, Facebook. We will post the webinar from today on YouTube in a day or so. Um, and please, please, please remember the follow-up survey. It's very, very useful for us. And we've gleaned a lot of information in the past, which has helped us do things on the, on the next um, session. 
So I'd like to say thanks very much again to our two presenters, to Todd and to Peter from Costain and from Zachary. Um, thanks also, also to, to Vineet for, for helping put to, together the presentations. Um, and thanks to the audience for listening in. And we'll see you on the next one, hopefully. Thanks very much. Bye for now.